a number of years ago on a family vacation, I drove from Dallas to California to take the kids to Disneyland. But we decided to go up to San Francisco first and then work our way down to L.A. If you've taken that route, you know there are a number of options that you have. But the scenic option along the California coastline, Route 1, is marvelous and at the same time treacherous. Route 1 is a very winding road. On one side are the mountains, and then the other are the cliffs leading down to the ocean. All along the route there are signs to help you to navigate safely through the twists and the turns and the oncoming vehicles. For one wrong move on Route 1, one inadvertent turn could cost you your life. It's a beautiful thing to look at, but it's a dangerous road to travel. When I thought about that, I thought about life. It's full of twists and turns. It's full of uncertainties, and many times you don't know what's coming around the bend. Life, if you've lived here long enough, you know that it can be tough to navigate. Many of us here today would love the opportunity to start over again because we've already run on some rocks. But what they have on Route 1, God has on the route of your life, and that are signposts designed to help you and me navigate this thing called life successfully. The question I want to address today is, why are there so many stalled vehicles on this road called life? Why are there so many with their hoods up, unable to go forward? Why do we look along the reef and find those who've gone over the cliff? And then the question becomes more intriguing when we want to know why so many of these are Christians who find themselves unable to navigate through the twists and turns of life. May I suggest to you probably no more greater word than I can give you than today that far too many of us as believers Believe in a God we don't trust. Everybody here today affirms the existence of God, and of course, if you're a believer, you affirm the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for you. And yet there seems to be a disconnect from my faith in Christ to get me to heaven and my trust in Christ to navigate me on earth. There seems to be a disconnect. And I'd like to suggest to you the disconnect is that many of us, maybe even most of us, don't trust him. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to navigate life. Wisdom is the ability to perceive the true nature of a thing and to implement the will of God regarding it. Wisdom is the ability to perceive the true nature of a thing, what's really going on, and then to have the ability to apply, implement the will of God regarding that perception. It's been called the art of skillful living. The ability to effectively apply truth to everyday decisions. Solomon understood its importance when he prayed, Lord, I, don't give me riches, give me wisdom. The book opens up with a cry for a father to teach his son the importance of gaining wisdom. In fact, he says in chapter 1, verse 20, that wisdom screams in the street. 
She lifts her voice in the square. Among all the noise that's around, wisdom says, please pay attention to me. In fact, it says in chapter 1, verse 33, he who listens to me, wisdom, shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. Many of us would not be where we are today if back then when we made the decision, we had more wisdom. You didn't need more money, you needed more wisdom. You wouldn't have made that decision at that time regarding that situation if you just had some wisdom. If I were to leave you with a thought, it would be this one. To start living the rest of your life wisely. How do you do that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That verse says three things. Those two verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's those three things I want to share with you now. Number one, trust in God entirely. The first thing you need to know if you're going to get wisdom, which is the way to navigate life successfully, you must trust in the Lord entirely. The word trust means to lay down on. It has the idea of putting one's complete weight on. It's much akin to what you're doing right now when you're sitting in the pew, when you're sitting in the seat, and all of your weight is resting on the ability of the pew upon which you're sitting to hold you up. Now, trusting in the pew to hold you up wouldn't mean much if the pew can't hold you up. But you've assumed something. You've assumed that the pew can hold you up. And the reason why I know it is not because you told me, because I'm looking right now and all your weight's on it. In fact, you are so secure about the pew's ability to sustain your weight and everybody on there with you, you're not even helping it out. I mean... I don't see anybody sitting, but kind of pushing themselves up in case. In case this pew doesn't make it, I want to make sure I got a little bit of me in here. Because this pew may not make it. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's start off with the order. Trust in the Lord. The reason why the order is critical is because when it comes to navigating our lives, most of us start with ourselves and work back to God. In other words, we start with what we think, what our perception is, what our orientation is, and when that does not work, we say, try God. There would be a lot less pain in life if you would start with God and not start with you or me start with myself. The proof that we don't trust God, even though we declare that we believe in him, is that we turn to other sources first to address life's problems. What you trust is where you go first. Did you hear me? You can always discover what you trust because you go there first. That is what you're banking on. And you bank on the thing you believe will be the best thing to help you. So that's where you go first. So if you want to know whether you trust in the Lord, answer the question, where do I go first? Why should I trust in the Lord first? So many scriptures we could turn to and time will not allow us to turn to them all. But I love the way 
Romans 11 puts it when he talks about the nature of God's wisdom because in communicating this, the Apostle Paul said that this way in Romans 11, 33, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways, who has known the mind of the Lord and who became his counselor or who has he first given to him that was not paid back to him again for from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He says the reason you should trust in the Lord is because his wisdom is beyond your ability to conceive it. Sometime when you go home, you need to read Job 28, verses 12 through 33, where Job says, I'm looking for wisdom. Where can I find it? He says, I looked to people. I couldn't find it there. I looked to the depths of the sea. I couldn't find it there. I looked up in the sky. I couldn't find it there. He says, I could not find wisdom among the living. Nothing around me could give me wisdom, but thou, O oh Lord, knowest it. The reason that you should trust in the Lord is because his wisdom is infinite. Infinite wisdom. His ability to coagulate and cross-coordinate all the events of history from time through eternity, his resume and experience, his omniscience and information base, says you go to him first. It's beyond finding out. The Bible says, let God be true, Romans 3, 4, and every man a liar. God says he wants you to come to him and then go to men. And if men aren't saying what he's saying, they're wrong, not him. No exceptions. Let every man be a liar. Unfortunately, what we have done is called God a liar and called people the truth. Created beings who are going to die like you, we call them the truth. We call the creator a liar. Oh, we don't use those words. We just don't go to him first. In understanding this, trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, that's a simple way of saying completely or entirely. The heart makes up your inner core being. Sometimes it refers to emotion. Sometimes it refers to intellect. Sometimes it refers to will. But since it could refer to any of the three, it simply means that you are to trust in the Lord completely, entirely, in every aspect of your life. Your knowledge, intellect, your decision-making, will, and your feelings, emotion. So that's, that's all you. At the heart of who you are, trust in the Lord. How do I know if I'm trusting in the Lord? Simple, you're not leaning to your own understanding. He gives the flip side or the negative of trusting in the Lord. Human understanding is flawed by sin. Human understanding is limited in scope by finiteness. You said, and I hear this all the time, people say, well, God expects me to use my brain, doesn't he? God has given us all common sense, hasn't he? Well, if it was that common, we wouldn't be where we are. Yes, God expects you to use your brain underneath his supervision. He, he doesn't expect you to use your brain apart from him. Because we are limited by finiteness, and we are flawed and contaminated by sin. Therefore, decision-making will always be questionable unless governed within the standard of the Lord. Paul says in Philippians 3.3, 3, put no confidence in the flesh. Don't Simply rest on your human capacity to make the right decision. You're not that good. And for 99.9% .9 of it, 
The only response we could give to that is amen and amen. We're not that good. If we were, we wouldn't have done that, that, this, that, and the other. We thought our own understanding when we first made the decision, it was a good one. It looked like that to us. The problem is our sight line is limited. Now, let me tell you what we do. Because we're Christians, we know we, we got to trust in the Lord because that's like comes with the job description. So we know we got to bleed this God stuff. We got to take the Bible seriously. You know, we got to go to church. So we, got, we know we got to trust in the Lord. But then we got this other side of us like the real world. We got the real world part. And in the real world, come on, you got to be practical in the real world. Okay, that Bible was written many years ago by men a long way away. And, and, and so let's get to the real world. So here's what most of us do. Watch this. I'm going somewhere. We mix the two. See, we mix the two because, see, we, we got to do the Christian stuff because we're Christians. But we live in the real world, so we got to do the real world stuff. And we mix the two. Now, the Bible has a word for mixing the two. It's called double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. When you mix the sacred and the secular... Because you want the secular to help the sacred. It's called double-mindedness. Or thinking with two minds. James 3 says, there is a wisdom from above that comes from God. And then he says, and there is a wisdom from below that comes from earthly thinking. And he says, the wisdom from below that comes from the natural way of thinking comes from hell. So he doesn't say the wisdom comes from hell. It says the wisdom comes from earth, but the wisdom that comes from earth comes from hell. So to think like a natural man is to join the devil's way of thinking. When you mix the two, you lose wisdom from God. James 1.5 says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. If any man needs guidance for decision making so that he can live a skillful life, let him ask of God. And guess what he says? One of the great promises in the Bible. Who gives it liberally? See, he's not stingy with it. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you direction. He wants to give you God. And he will give you an abundance of it. But then he goes on and gives a warning. He says, but when you ask, ask in faith, not doubting, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And watch this. Here's the curse. Let not that man think he will receive anything from the Lord. You say, but I prayed about it. But if God saw a double mind, he's not going to answer your prayer. I got counseling about it. But if it was based on a double mind, the mixing of the secular and the sacred, and by mixing of the secular and the sacred, a non-Christian worldview trying to be mixed with a Christian worldview, the Bible says that negates me. So, we actually, watch this, cancel out Sunday usually every Monday. Yes. Most Christians cancel Sunday on Monday because then they go to a secular, that is natural or non-Christian viewpoint and try to mix it with Sunday. Yes. Yeah. And God says that man will receive nothing from the Lord. Well, now, this is explaining why we're not seeing prayers answered. Because God's saying, I see you mixing stuff. If a plane was flying high, a plane needs a control tower. Control tower says, well, you got a plane here, a plane there. It's cloudy. You can't see it. And you're talking about, but I think it's okay. You, you don't have that ability. You are limited. That's why you need a control tower. What you think right now is irrelevant. Not because your brain is irrelevant. Your brain is absolutely critical to navigate the plane. 
but your sight you can't see. So you need to adjust your brain to what the tower says. So many of us are canceling out by trying to mix human and divine wisdom. I, that may not sound as deep as it is, but if you're mixing it, God says, I can't help you. I can't help you. I, I didn't go through, I, I haven't been God for zillions of years to need help. My son Jonathan developed this new hobby in college, breeding pit bulls. I don't know where this has come from. I, I, I can't conceive of where this idea of breeding pit bulls has come from, but this has become his hobby in college. So he's, he's had like six or seven pit bulls. And I guess it's uh, some entrepreneurial mindset he's in because he, try, he breeds them and sells them. Maybe I ain't giving him enough money at college or something, but, but that, that's kind of his thing. He comes home on the weekends and he brings two of the pit bulls with him. Not a happy situation at my house. He connects these pit bulls to this cord that they can't break and they're in the yard. Now these, these two pit bulls are pretty friendly and, and, and everything so they're, they're not like these violent kind but they're pit bulls. I walk out to the yard this past weekend. I'm walking in the yard and the particular friendly one of the two wants to play. He wants to jump up. He wants, to, he wants some activity. In coming to me to play, he goes the wrong way around the tree. So he wraps the cord around the tree. I'm trying to get him to go back the other way because at the way he's going, he's entangling himself. But he doesn't know better. I'm trying to get him back around this way. One time he thinks I'm playing with him. The next time he thinks I don't know what I'm doing. So he continues to go in his own understanding. He continues to go his own way. Now, it wasn't that he wasn't sincere. It wasn't that he was not dedicated. It just, he doesn't under, he's a dog. So he doesn't understand and he keeps going his own way. I keep trying to pull him back and now he's resisting me. Because he doesn't think I know what I'm doing. He wants me to not bother him. He wants me to leave him alone, but left to his own understanding. All he's doing is entangling himself more. By the time we are finished this exercise, he can't move because he's wrapped it so many times around the tree that he is stuck. Now all of a sudden, it dawns on him, he did not know what he was doing. So now the dog that wanted to be independent on his own, do his own thing, is now going, mm, 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 now he crying. All of a sudden, I'm significant now. I'm important now. I'm strategic now. Because he done wrapped himself up. He did that because he's a dog. Dog. Because what we do in our beastly way of thinking is insist on our own way. And even when God pushes us, we say, I don't like that. We go this way until we have wrapped ourselves up around the circumstances of life. And now we want to drop to our knees and go, hmm, 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 hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and that means don't lean to your own understanding. Don't, he doesn't say don't have it, he says don't lean on it. You can have your thoughts, but those thoughts have to be measured against the standard. God told Peter, don't throw your net on that side, throw it on the other side. The problem was Peter was a professional fisherman. Peter knew where you throw the net, when you throw the net. Peter said, Jesus, look, we've been out here all night, all right? So they're not biting Jesus. 
Look, I know where to throw the net. I, I was raised in a fisherman's family. I'm president of the Zebedee Fishing Corporation. I know how to fish. But Peter says, to humor you, let me go ahead and do what you say just so you can see that really, really you ought to stick to preaching. I know fish, you know sermons, stick to that. The Bible says that, that the net got so full it was dragging the boats under. See, left to his own understanding, he would have been fishless. Mary didn't understand how this thing could be. She says, how can this be since I am a virgin? How can I be pregnant? The angel says, well, there's nothing impossible with God. And so she says, may it be as the Lord said. My own understanding can't figure this out. However, if it's you talking... Let it be. God sends Abraham to a place he had not gone. He goes by faith, looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He acted not on his own understanding or else he wouldn't have left. Moses, I mean, Moses? We're talking about a man raised in Pharaoh's house. We're talking about Holly Edgemacated. We're talking about a guy who has been trained. We're talking about a guy who had wealth. We talk about a guy who had it all, who didn't need divine information, except he made a decision to suffer with the people of God because he was going to use his information. I am not suggesting don't get your college degree, but you have to understand, when you get your BA, uh, MBA, PhD, all you have gotten is information. And information doesn't automatically transfer to wisdom. You could have just moved from being an uneducated fool to an educated fool. Wisdom is the ability to use it correctly in making life's choices. Let me tell you one of the the key ways in which you will face this question of wisdom, it is when you are facing a trial. When you're going through it, it's always our natural tendency to want our own way out of it because we don't understand that God is doing something with it. You've got to take the perspective of Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, everything's going apart from me now. It's killing me now, but I'm still going to trust him. Him. I'm going to rest completely and rely completely on him to deal with this. I'm not going to get out of it my own human way. That is a way that is unprescribed by him. But you can't mix the two. You can't have church and your horoscope. See, you cancel it and you don't have to go to a horoscope. All you got to go is to human understanding. You know, you don't have to go to Scientology. You don't have to go to astrology. All you got to go is to human viewpoint. And you cancel the wisdom of God. So with all your heart, that means entirely, completely, no exceptions, you must lean on God and not on you or anybody you know. You have to lean on that which is giving you God, whether it comes to your mind or the brain of somebody else. Secondly, you must trust God intimately. First of all, you must trust him entirely, all your heart. Now you must trust him intimately. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Now, acknowledgement, the word here, acknowledgement, does not mean a quaint recognition, like um, if I come into the room and you say good morning to me, you've acknowledged my presence. That's not what it's talking about, acknowledgement. The word acknowledgement here has to do with an intimate response based on knowledge and relationship whereby pleasing that person becomes your goal. Acknowledging who he is in relationship to who you are. How do we illustrate this? When a woman gets married, 
maybe one who's been single for a long time. A lady who's been used to making her own decisions, running her own life, being her own independent person. But now she gets married. There is a, an adjustment she must learn to make now when it comes to her decisions. Her decisions are no longer just about her. She now must acknowledge somebody else in the relationship. She, she's got to acknowledge the fact that there is somebody else that I must consult before either I make this decision or if I don't have to consult them because I know them so well, I can go ahead and make it because I know they would be okay with it. Or if there's a question about it, she has to now say, well, let me check with my husband first and I'll get back to you. That's acknowledgement. Acknowledgement has to do with bringing the leader to bear before the decision is made. Either because you know what their decision would be, so you don't even have to talk to them about it, or you don't know what the decision should be, so you have to talk to them about it. That's acknowledgement. How broad is this acknowledgement? Well, I think the verse says, in all your ways. In all your ways. God wants to be involved in the details of your life. How many of them? All of them. All of them. He wants to be a partner in this relationship, actually, the leader of the relationship who is consulted about anything involving the relationship. When you write a check, I hope you have consulted with the bank first. Now, there are two ways you can consult with the bank when you write a check. When you consult, you consult intuitively or personally. You consult intuitively because you just know that you have it there. You just know I deposited my check and, and I have my offering or whatever the bill is that you're paying. So I know it's there. So I'm consulting, but it's an intuitive consult. I don't have to actually call the bank or I don't have to get online because I just know it's been deposited in there. So it's a consulting, but it's intuitive. Or if there is a question, then you get online or you call the bank to make sure you can cover the charge. But in all cases, if you are a responsible adult person, barring some rare exception of miscalculation, you have the mindset of the bank always on your mind when you write the check because you know the resources are there to cover it. So the bank is directly or indirectly always on your mind. God is saying when it comes to life's directions and negotiating life, he is the source of your resources. Make sure the account can support the decision. We make decisions that our spiritual account can support and we wonder why our life keeps bouncing. How do you consult with God? How do you acknowledge him in all things? It really, it's fairly simple. The word and prayer. The word and prayer. I am amazed at how many of us don't use the word when it comes to the decisions of life. We come to hear a sermon, but we don't use the word when it comes to a decision of life. And there is a principle or a precept for every decision in life in the Bible. In the Bible, there is a principle or a precept for every decision that you make. There's a principle or precept for who you should marry, principle or precept about having children, there's a principle or precept about job choice and job career, there's a principle and precept about how to get out of debt, there's a principle and precept about how to invest money, there's a principle and precept about how to handle illness. I've been preaching for over 30 years and I have yet in 30 years of ministry had one situation come across my desk, come across my ministry where there has not been a biblical principle or precept to address it. I have not been one and I have dealt with millions of different scenarios and there's always a principle or precept. 
You say, but the Bible does not maybe give me the specifics. It gives me, sometimes it gives me the general, but I need something more specific. That's why it has to be the word of God and prayer. Because the job of the Holy Spirit is to apply the word of God to your personal situation. The Holy Spirit's job is to take what may be a general principle and now make it your principle to your situation. That's why it's spirit and word, spirit and truth. In all of your ways, consult him. Don't just do it because you think it. Do it because you like it. Do it because all your friends do it. That is not acknowledging him. That's discounting him. I had a husband and wife come to me one time. The husband was ticked off. And the husband was ticked off because he says, my wife goes and asks all these other men what they think about something, a decision, and then she comes to me. He says, when she comes to me, I don't want to talk about it. Not because it's not a worthy discussion, but you don't go and talk to five other guys and then come to your husband. You come to me first. In all your ways, acknowledge me. It could be vice versa. The point is, it's simply to state that God says, I want to be first, I don't want to be mixed with anything that does not agree with me, and I want to be consulted about all your ways. You're to trust God entirely. You're to trust God intimately. Finally, you are to trust God progressively. And he will make your paths straight. Wow. Make your paths straight. He will make your paths straight. Listen to that slowly then. He will, meaning you won't have to. He will make your paths straight. Uh, It doesn't get any better than that. Anybody here crooked? Life is crooked. Finances are crooked. Marriage is crooked. Single life is crooked. Future is crooked. He says he will make your path straight. Now, a path means you're going somewhere. A path is always connected to a destination. So so that means you going somewhere. At least you trying to go somewhere. At least you supposed to be going somewhere. Or maybe you are going somewhere. Going in circles. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. Oh, around and around. Because a lot of folks are going in circles. They're not going anywhere. Because they got a wild path and a crooked path and they're here today and they're tomorrow and they don't know where they are. He says, he will. If you do it this way, trust him entirely, Trust him intimately, and then trust him progressively. The word, make your path straight, the concept there, was used of travel being made safe by leveling a road to remove the obstacles in order so the traveler could reach the goal. You say, every time I try to go somewhere, I got this boulder. I got people stopping me. I got circumstances stopping me. I got money stopping me. I just don't seem to be able to get off the dime. I don't seem to be able to get where I'm supposed to go. I don't know what to do. God says he will. Remove the boulders. (laughs) Get rid of the obstacles. And make your path go toward his intended destination for you. To put it another way, he says, wisdom allows you to experience God's plan for your life. Chapter 3, verse 2 says, for the length of days and years of life and peace will be added to you. Verse 24 says, you will lie down and you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Whoa. Isn't the time you got a full night's sleep again? Says, if you will take wisdom seriously, you won't need those sleeping pills related to life's direction and decisions. He says, I will make your sleep sweet. 
The Bible says, and the Lord giveth his beloved sleep. Because he's clearing the boulders. You're staying up because you're trying to figure out how to move them. But he says, if you get it in line like this, guess what? I will move them for you. When you listen to the traffic report or the weather report, you turn on the radio and you listen to somebody who's looking at a picture you can't see. God says he rewards the path and address the hindrances so that you get to your intended destination. Whenever I travel, people pick me up or they send a car to pick me up. I never, if I'm going on a ministry trip, rent a car. The reason I don't rent a car is because I don't know where I am and I don't know where I'm going. Okay? If another pastor invites me to a church or a conference and I accept the engagement, they pick me up. They send the same thing we do when we invite our guests here. We pick them up. If they want us to, I let them pick me up. Because if it's a place I've never been before, I don't want to go through all the headache of looking at the map and trying to drive and read the map and going through all of that. When there is somebody there who lives there, who knows the way, who's been the way before, you know what I do? I get on the passenger side and let them lead me down the path to my location. Why kill myself when there's somebody who already knows how to get there? Why wait in a line? Why, why go through the extra added, added? Why, why do that when there is somebody who already knows? Even if I know the path and I take the path, if there's something blocking the path, I don't have time to look for an alternative route. But if they already live there, they know where to get off, where to get on. They know the side streets. Let me tell you something about God. He knows the alternative routes to get you to your destination. God wants you to start trusting him so you can start living again. God wants you to trust him entirely. He wants your complete trust unmixed. He does not want a non-biblical, non-Christian worldview to be integrated in your thinking anymore. He doesn't want the feminist movement telling you ladies how to be a wife. He doesn't want guys who don't know God telling you the definition of a man. He does not want Wall Street giving you the ethics of business. He does not want Fifth Avenue telling you what you have to buy and have to own. He does not want a mixture. He wants to entirely control you, and he wants to be intimately involved with the process. And he says then he will progressively move you to where you ought to go. We don't have time for our own understanding. So what God wants to know is, are you going to just believe in me or will you trust me? In the movie The Titanic, There was one scene that enraptured everybody. It was a scene that was repeated over and over and over and over again. Every time the movie or a clip from the movie was shown, this scene was there. And it wasn't the Titanic going under. That wasn't the scene. It was another scene. Her name was Rose. And Rose is living an empty, meaningless fruitless life. She, she's living large. She's, she's with the upper crust. She's, she's got notoriety. She is engaged to a great guy. She's, uh, all of this stuff is going on, but deep down in Rose's heart, she is empty. Rose meets Jack. And Jack doesn't have all this fancy stuff that she has, but Jack loves her. She comes up to the deck of the boat And when she comes up to the deck of the boat, Jack is on the deck and calls Rose over to the bow and says, take my hand. Jack stretches out his hand to Rose. 
and he leads Rose over to the bow of the ship. He says, close your eyes. She closes her eyes and is ready to talk. He says, shh, don't, don't, don't speak. Just close your eyes. She's holding on to the pole at the bow of the boat. And Jack says, let go. Uh, yeah. What do you mean let go? I'm hanging over the ocean. He says, let go. Uh. She's scared to let go. She's nervous to let go. She's terrified to let go because this is her security. He says, let go. And then he asks her, do you trust me? If you trust me, let go. She lets her hand go, leaving her hand totally at the mercy of Jack. She lets her hand go. Jack says, open your eyes. She opens her eyes and is hanging over the bow of the boat in the breeze, looking out over the ocean at the water. And she says, I'm flying. I'm flying. Some of you got to let go. You've been holding on to your own way of thinking, own way of living, own way of operating, own way of feeling, own way of acting, own way of cogitating all of your life. And while you come to church on tomorrow, you're going back to your own way. And God is saying, let go. Yes. You say, yeah, but you don't understand. I've held on to that. Let go. Yes. But you don't understand. Let go. But God, do you trust me? And God is saying, if you let go, yes. 